Okay, well, we're ready to go again, and our last speaker today is Martin Jones, our Vice Master, obviously well known to most people here. Uh, Martin is the George Pitt Rivers Professor of Archaeological Science. Uh, so, archaeology, prehistory, but Martin's going to talk a part about the application of science to figuring out what was going on and then gain, securing the clues. Uh, but you might want to look, remind yourself from your menu what you ate for lunch, because he's going to be talking about some of the key ingredients of, of that menu. So, Martin, before the Silk Road, the globalization in, in prehistory. Over to you. Thank you, Mary. Well, hello, everyone, and I'm. A I'm aware that I'm the last speaker, so I'll try not to uh, make it too heavy. But what I, when we share food, we do two things, and we intertwine them. On the one hand, there is the whole issue of the food quest and getting enough calories and nutrients and uh, engaging with nature to produce that and get the right amounts and the right quantities. But once we've done that, we, we mix up the ingredients and stuff in the most complicated ways to tell a whole series of stories. And those are stories about uh, who we are and who we are not, and stories about where we've come from and where we hope to go to. And those stories can be on many scales simultaneously. So we may, when we share food, be talking about our family, our tribe, our religious community, and we might be alluding to our life um, experience, or to several centuries, or to several m millennia. And some of the stories embedded in the way that we share food go back um, to early Homo sapiens um, in Africa. Now, uh, my work is to kind of probe down to try and unpick those deep time stories that are part of our sharing food. But in order to approach that and tell you something about the um, research that my research group are doing, I want to do a sort of archaeology of your lunch. And you've already started your homework, so I hope you're, you're concentrating. Now, if you look at the menus and, and look at um, something which tells a story, I think, I think the, the, um, the clue with this one is it's in a foreign language. So we can see that our um, pastora arabiata, we immediately think of, uh, of, of Italy. And uh, many Italian families would see it as something that they've eaten in their grandmother made and, 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 and so on and so forth. But when we start unpicking the ingredients, it all gets a bit more complicated. So one, two of the key ingredients in the pasta arabiata are the things that give it its flavor, are the chilies and the tomatoes. And both of these come from uh, domestic in America. So uh, the tomatoes in the mon mountainous regions of Peru and the chilies in, in Mexico. And so that's a bit puzzling. And then if we look at the rest of it, um, uh, the noodles and the whole idea of tagliatelle or spaghetti. Although, although the, the, ancient, the, the classical Romans had something that was lasagna, something like a lasagna, they didn't have noodles. And so for, as far as we can tell, the noodles um, come from uh, China. And, and there is an image of the oldest noodles in the world. That's, a, that's an upturned pot. And those are, are the early noodles. They're about 4,000 years old from uh, central China. And, um, and so that comes from uh, the other end. And the, the interesting too, it's not just the noodles. I suspect you were eating your noodles with a, your tagliatelle with a fork. And all of the technology of not touching food comes from the East too. So this is the earliest knife and fork I know from. Um, and this is also from more or less the same time period in the same place as the earliest noodles. So. Um, <clears throat> If we, um, if we unpick what a, a, a dish like pa pasta rabbiata is about, it is an Italian dish, but it's, 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 a, it's a mercantile swaggering dish. I mean, in a sense, its origins are with Venetian merchants who are not celebrating their, their ancestry, they're ce celebrating their mercantile power and, and decorating their cuisine with, the, with, with the, the limits of their mercantile power both in terms of, this, of, of the overland silk route and, um, and, uh, and, and maritime uh, trade. <coughs> and this is what a lot of uh, cuisine is about, that its origins 
are in some sort of swaggering um, uh, expression of imperial power. And then it gradually gets internalized as something very local. And if, if I was at school teaching about the history of the British Empire, what I get the school kids to do is to unpick a Christmas pudding. And you can find the entire history of the British Empire in the ingredients for a Christmas pudding. <coughs> so a key element about the pasta rabbiata is it's about a major period of food globalization that is well studied. And it's described as the Columbian Exchange. And, and obviously, from the name, it's after 1492. And all sorts of things moved around the world. Um, maize and, and potatoes moved uh, not just to Europe and Africa, but the missing arrows uh, on this one are in China. It's clear that by the 17th century, a number of these new world crops um, were in China. And various uh, uh, flavorings are going backwards and forwards. And then from the old world, wheat, in particular wheat, but also pigs, rye, and cattle are going into the um, new world. And two things were going on in parallel in terms of that process. On the one hand, there is that imperial bringing together of food from all over the place. And the other thing that's happening is that staples are moving around, and such as the sweet potato and the potato you had at lunch. And they're coming to the old world, largely um, uh, not so much uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the sort of uh, showing off menu, but basically as a staple food plant for various um, workforces who are trying to get calories out of a very small plot of land. And so the Irish potato on the, on the, on the small plots on the large English estates are one example, and the potatoes and sweet potatoes, were the, was, uh, you get um, the same thing both in, in, the Afri in West Africa and in China. <clears throat> so that was a period of... Um, of um, uh, very important globalization of uh, food. Well, let's move to another one of your, um, that has, it's not uh, written in Thai, but uh, you can tell from the name that that has an association too with a particular place, the Thai fish curry. And look at the gr ingredients of these and where these came. You have coriander, actually it's from Southwest Asia, uh, like a lot of, um, uh, of, of, of foodstuffs. And then uh, uh, peppercorns, which are from the Malabar coast uh, in India. Uh, coconut from uh, the Indian Ocean and Southeast Asia. And uh, ginger from South China. So they're quite spread out. And the interesting thing about these ones is, uh, uh, as, um, as well as being a, a, a Thai dish and, and reflecting some movement of crops, all of these ingredients could be found in Roman Europe. And so, um, well, coriander, not surprisingly. Um, we, there's, some, there's some really interesting digs now on Roman Egypt and the ports along Roman Egypt in which things like ginger and coconut and vast quantities of peppercorns are, are showing up. And they were feeding a, a similar sort of cuisine. So this sort of dish would be um, uh, not an unsurprising dish in Roman Europe. Again, to display, if you like, the... the, the the power of the Roman Empire and the limits of the Roman Empire. <coughs> and um, as I say, in, in, uh, in particularly in the ports of Egypt, you can find a whole series um, of these examples. But even if you were an unlucky as uh, a Roman soldier and got posted to the, the awful uh, weather of the offshore island of Britannia, then you still had some of these things. And there's a series of peppercorns that have turned up in the Roman uh, sites in Britain. So this whole idea of marking out uh, your identity by something from the distant uh, reaches of, of, of the empire is something that happened there. <coughs> so um, this dish reflects an earlier episode that was particularly important in food globalization, which is really sort of um, the beginnings of a Silk Road. Now, I know the Silk Road into the medieval period we think of for obvious reasons as the overland route of the Silk Road. And more and more um, uh, information now is emphasizing uh, the maritime routes along uh, the Indian Ocean and up into the Red Sea. And this is both archeology, span as I say, particularly of Egyptian sites, but also there are some textual evidence. Here's, here's a list of the third century AD plants from, uh, plants from the uh, west, the Weilue, 
which uh, is, is largely a, a series of quite fancy things, but it has rosemary in there, turmeric, saffron, white aconite, rue oil. And then uh, the, from the a, a, a classical source, the Periplus of the Erythraean, Erythraean Sea, you can see a number of things there that are featured in your lunch, uh, sesame, pepper, and uh, coconut, uh, all showing up there. So this was a, it's a second episode. Now the thing, these are, for, um, for my research, quite late episodes, both the classical period globalization and the um, Colombian globalization. And the thing that, um, uh, oh, and I just wanted to add um, another uh, point here of, of your desserts. Now, now I, just a, a sort of aside here, I, I, um, I um, mentioned earlier that, that food is about saying who we are and who we are not. Now, I don't know how you ate the food, but I guess quite a lot of you will have started with the savory options and gone on to eat the dessert um, afterwards. And, uh, but a number of you will be familiar that that's, that's, that's not um, necessarily the case if you go to, if you like, uh, Arabic cuisine where you can have honey and sweet things and almonds uh, in the cuisine earlier in the course. It wasn't, it's still not true in rural China. I've noticed recently that the big cities of China are going western and doing the, having, do, having the dessert after the uh, savory course. And it certainly wasn't true in the Roman world where um, sweet and savory were all, all mixed up. And um, uh, uh, <coughs> if one tracks back the order in which you ate it, and which a, a, a eminent anthropologist, Jack Goody, did, he traced it back to medieval Fra southern France and there, it was clear what was happening was, or his interpretation was those communities were, were, were sorting out their cuisine into sweet, then uh, savory, then sweet, in order to emphasize that they weren't Muslims. And, uh, and, and so uh, it was by a, a performance of how you eat food placed um, uh, the community into who they were Christians and who they weren't mus Muslims. Now, I'm sure that uh, when you did the same thing, there was no implicit um, aggro towards religious minorities in your choice, but it's an example of how those historic things get incorporated in, into how we think it's totally normal to eat. But anyway, in terms of the ingredients, the apples were a really interesting one. All the apples um, that, that uh, we eat as domestic apples, their ancestry traces trace back to valleys in Tajikistan, and we're not entirely sure when they moved out, but it's clear that by the Roman period, uh, apples of, of, of Tajik ancest uh, ancestry were, uh, were in Europe. <coughs> Sesame is from South India, and again, by the, the, um, the similar period, uh, it was everywhere, um, 2,000 years ago about, it was everywhere from Africa to Han China. And the banana is a really interesting one. Uh, there is a, something called a phytolith, a silica, particle that you can identify bananas um, from. And what people think or have argued is, is the um, edible banana has turned up in uh, Africa in 500 AD. So there's lots of hints of these um, uh, spreads um, across the, the world. Well, this is the one that um, after all those tastings, I was delighted to hear from Mary that the millet all got uh, uh, finished up because this is, this is the plant or the series of plants that, I, that I've become particularly interested in over the last 10 years and done a lot of research on. And uh, millets are a series of small grain cereals and there's a lot of them around uh, the world and a large number of millet species that um, have their origins either to the um, uh, regions of uh, uh, south of the Sahara in Africa, or two key ones, broom corn and foxtail, have their origins in, uh, in Inner Mongolia in North China. <coughs> now, um, it's, not, it, it's, not a, it's, not, it's neither a series of crops that modern agronomists are that interested in. Uh, um, they're, they're much more interested in the wheat, rice, and maize, the large grained. Uh, cereals, and it has. Before we worked on it, it, has, it wasn't really a crop that um, the archaeobotanists and archaeologists were interested in, and and I got interested in it um, uh, doing a completely different project by accident when I, when 
uh, it, became, it, it became clear that there were remains of the Asian millets in um, prehistoric Europe. And uh, what unfolded um, into you know, one of those productive periods of my research career was just um, uh, working on this puzzle of, of, of why there was a Chinese crop sort of bird seed in prehistoric sites in Europe. And um, <clears throat> at the time, the kind of model of what uh, 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 the spread of agriculture was like was that on the one hand, in the purple, you had these major crops, wheat and barley, which very early on, you know, by about uh, uh, you know, four or 5,000 BC, had spread um, around Europe, around North Africa, and into India. And uh, at, at a similar time, there was clearly a parallel spread of rice um, in East Asia. And um, as I say, the, the thing that was completely puzzling was that in small quantities, there seemed to be Asian millets mixed up with, um, with, with the regular Western crops in, um, in Europe. And I, I, I went out with another um, past Darwin fellow, Jin Liu, in 2005 to go and track down the archaeobotany and the archaeology of minute in North China. And it just happened at a time when, when my field of archaeology, archaeobotany, was taking off that they were finding lots and lots of, of minute in China. But in addition, for the first time, some of my Chinese colleagues were finding uh, wheat and, and barley in, in um, four and a half thousand year old deposits in China. So looking for the millet and looking for it in China started opening up a much more complicated pattern in which millet was going one way and, uh, and wheat and barley were going the other way. <coughs> and at the same time, other groups, apart from ourselves, were, were, were we're finding other mixtures, and uh, uh, Dorian Fuller's group in uh, London were doing a lot of work around North India, and finding that, again, sites of, of, of the third millennium BC, about four and a half thousand years ago, uh, were, had rice from uh, Asia, the African millets uh, from Africa, as well as the, um, the Southwest Asian crops in China. So this was all coming together in, in something that by the third millennium BC uh, was in place and is the earlier episode of, of food globalization in prehistory, largely involving these sta staple energy crops <coughs> and um, spreading right across a Asia and Europe. And the thing that was kind of really interesting about this is it was happening um, uh, before the Silk Road, obviously, but if you look at the uh, evidence of of burials and so uh, of archaeology, you can push back uh, elements of the Silk Road route to about, say, about 1200 BC. And this globalization was happening long before that and before there was uh, elements of fancy goods. And the way one can interpret that is that this was a, a, a pretty much a bottom-up thing. It didn't involve... Uh, uh, it wasn't led by chiefs and merchants with rich graves and so forth. It seemed to be something that was happening without a material um, imprint. Well, because it doesn't have a material imprint, we have to look for it and understand it uh, using a series of methods that are uh, variously novel or less conventional. And uh, in our project, Food Globalization in Prehistory, we've pulled together <coughs> um, three different forms of, of work. And one is, uh, is, is looking at, at genetics. I'm going to say something a bit about genetics. Uh, the, the, the changes in, in genetics over the last 15 years have completely transformed archaeology. And I think the geneticists themselves, as, as different genomes started getting understood and coded and so forth, I think it surprised everybody including the geneticists, how much historical information was in there, how much, um, as well as the functional thing of, of making proteins and, and making organisms, there was masses of, of information that related to um, uh, uh, 
hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, millions of years ago. And so genetics and the possibility of genetic analysis has really transformed archaeology. <coughs> so we've, we've, we've used genetics to get broad geographical patterns with some sense of time depth. Another field which is quite interesting is um, stable isotope dietary studies. And that is looking at stable isotopes of particularly carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen uh, in the bones, which chart what particular individuals have eaten. And um, if, if you get discrimination in isotopes in the crops, that'll get mirrored in what's uh, in the isotopic pattern in the bones. And so we can use stable isotope uh, dietary studies on precisely dated uh, cemeteries and look at regional food patterns and who's eating what in different places. And then this is <clears throat> the more old-fashioned thing um, of looking at charred cereal grains from archaeological sites. And from those preserved grains, getting precise dates and precise taxonomy. So those three go together to kind of build a map of what's going on. And I'm just going to give you a taster of um, two of those to give you um, a feel of how we proceed on that. Here's my colleague, Harriet Hunt, one of the group. Um, and she is one of the um, prime geneticists in the group. And uh, what, what's in her flower pots in the Botanic Garden, each one of these is what we call um, a land race. And what a land race is, is the way I define a land race, is if farmers um, buy their seed corn in a market, it's not a land race, it's a commercial cultivar. If they get it from their, um, their parents or their friends um, or... Uh, or, or within the kin network, then that's what a land race is. And, and these land races preserve an extraordinary geographical imprint that one can relate to um, uh, deep patterns in a way that I'll show you in a minute. So, so, so this might be uh, um, a, a, a millet from, uh, from Kazakhstan, and this one might be a millet from Romania, and so forth. And she's just um, growing them up so she can do genetic analysis <coughs> and try and um, build up geographical pictures. Most of the genetics we do is on land races and looking for the history within the living crop. We do two other things. Um, uh, one is, as you can well imagine, the 20th century has seen the loss of an enormous number of land races as, 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 as farming around the world has got streamlined. And so there's a really useful backup, which is um, what we call historic DNA, which is basically things that are um, uh, plants that have been preserved dry for, say, 100 years or 200 years, and their DNA is pretty um, intact. And this is from the Vavilov Herbarium in St. Petersburg. And just by looking at the historic DNA, we get, a, we get some of that lost diversity of the 20th century and greatly enrich um, the land race um, <coughs> um, uh, complement from modern fields. The third form is, um, uh, uh, these are uh, millet grains about the same age as that pasta, 4,000 4, years old. And um, uh, these have pretty good DNA um, uh, conservation in. Um, but as with all ancient DNA, it's, it, it's harder work to, to get the genetic sequence. So we use the um, archaeological, the really ancient DNA, for hypothesis testing. Once we build a hypothesis, about uh, what's going on from the modern material. We say, well, if we're right, in Xinjiang in West China in 4000 BC, it should look like this. And then we test it against um, those archaeological specimens. So we put those three together in that manner. And this is the kind of map um, uh, we go. So Harriet there, uh, she's used some, um, for those who aren't geneticists, the only thing you, that you need to know about this is that these are genetic sequences that are what we call non-coding. They don't actually make proteins, so they're not, they're not part of the functioning of the plant today. And they're the ones that embody a mass of history. And uh, in this case, uh, each of those circles there is one of the land races, and the ellipses are just to group together, if you like, um, a series of lines or tribes, a series of lineages um, within those land races. And you'll see um, where they all coincide, or where all but one coincide, is in North China 
in, in just the same place that archaeologically we find the earliest millet remains. And in a nutshell, each one of these um, uh, lineages is a story, preserves a story of millet spreading from its region of origin to another part of the world. So these are, these are the millets that spread into China, and the yellow and the red ones are the ones that got as far as Europe. So it, it creates a kind of a geography that we can start drilling down and saying, well, what, what is the yellow one? What is the red one? And how, and how can we um, uh, nail that to archaeological stories? <coughs> so a lot of that sort of broader ge geography is by looking at bits of genetics that don't actually make um, the sequence for proteins. Um, more and more, we're um, also looking at the genes that uh, do actually do something in the living plant. And I just want to um, uh, mention one of them, which is about our stickiness. And um, I'm, I'm delighted that, uh, that Ferg has got you some, some, some sticky cereal as part of, uh, to accompany uh, the Thai fish curry. And this is a really interesting thing about, it's not about the ecology of the plant, it's about culinary choices. And in East Asia, there's a really, really long tradition of whole grain boiling, steaming, and sticky cuisine. And if you have this slurpy, sticky stuff, uh, then you also need something to hold it, which uh, explains what this is a steamer from about 2000 BC, which in East Asia, uh, pottery is much older than it is in uh, West Asia. And the whole idea of sitting around a pot of sticky, slurpy stuff and really favoring the stickiness of it is something that seems to have a really deep history in East Asia, going way back beyond um, agriculture itself. <coughs> and as I mentioned, um, you need some technology to pick up sticky stuff. And I, I've shown some more recent forks here. These are Byzantine forks of the 9th century AD. And, uh, it, um, and forks, as we well know, came to Europe. And in the first stages, um, these were um, regarded as, as quite uh, suspect things. And, and the church, in particular, didn't like forks. And I think there were two reasons there. I mean, one was the place where um, merchants first found forks was probably in some uh, 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 East Mediterranean port where it may be that... Uh, uh, someone was uh, sitting on their client's knee, sort of uh, feeding them sweetmeats with these dodgy things. Um, but in, in addition, uh, the, the church was clear that uh, God gave you hands. You know, why, um, why, do, um, why do you need to invent these things? And just to get before looping back to genetics, there's an equally old tradition in the West of handheld food and a performance of breaking and dividing and sharing and the ones on, I've just got two examples here <coughs> of, of that tradition. But that's a tradition that, again, goes way back. The idea both of a baked loaf that you can break and split. But if one switches on to other forms of cuisine in the, rest, in the West, if you think of the roast and the barbecue, that's rather similar. I mean, it's you, someone cuts it up and divides it out um, like that. So a completely different performance. Um, and a completely different uh, way of, of thinking about food, which, again, you can see started moving towards the east. Uh, those are some, some cakes from uh, Han Tomb in Gansu, <coughs> first century BC, and some modern decorated white loaves. In terms of the, the uh, antiquity of this, one, one of my uh, proud uh, archaeological discoveries is on a 25-year-old archaeological site in Central Europe, where I think that my team found the, the, the oldest burnt breadcrumbs. Now, it happens to be on the same site that has the oldest three-dimensional human representations. And, and, and it's only when I have a captive audience like this I can try and persuade you that my burnt breadcrumbs are at least as important as this, uh, <laughs> this turning point in the history of art. So, uh, so humor me. But going back to the uh, genetics, um, one element of stickiness is that um, there, are, there are genes for that sticky. <clears throat> that sticky rice that you had um, uh, today, what's happened in that is, um, for those of you who are chemists, the uh, amylose starch has been really reduced, and the amylopectin is uh, dominating the starch. And, and, and so, so there's been a genetic switch to change the starch chemistry. And you can pick that up 
um, you can pick that up in, uh, in, 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 in the genes. And this is just Harriet's um, uh, groups again. And it won't surprise you at all that most, almost all of the sticky um, uh, genes are over in the east. But one really, the reason I show you this one is because uh, there's a few examples over in the west of unexpressed um, sticky genes in the western millets. In other words, they're kind of like our, uh, I think it's our tonsils that used to be gills when we were fish. Um, they're a, they're a, a, a silent memory of what things used to be like uh, when they came from Asia. So uh, again, before this prehistoric spread into Europe, um, there, there was the sticky cuisine there. And the interesting thing is it was, it was selected against, but not removed uh, 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 when these cereals came to the West. At the same time as when barley in particular went East, they selected for sticky versions of barley. So you can get sticky barley and a sticky oat and sticky rye in the East. I just want to quickly mention something about um, the isotopic evidence. So this is uh, one of a series of cemeteries <coughs> um, on something called the Hershey Corridor, which is a corridor between the East and the West, um, uh, uh, down, down which um, a lot of the contact in this early period happened. And one of the things we can do, as I mentioned, with uh, the bones from, bones from these uh, cemeteries, is we can pick out, look, by looking at the isotopic balance in them, we can get a sense of what they ate. And I'll just show you some data from um, four uh, cemeteries in that Hershey Corridor. <coughs> and, uh, and these, I'll explain this in a minute with a couple of loops, but there's the carbon isotope balance down on the bottom axis. And uh, they come in two groups. Uh, on, against that bottom axis. And to cut a long story short, um, this is, uh, this is uh, about the measure you would get if you only ate millet, which is a C4 crop. And this is the measure you get if you meet a, a millet of a mix of millet and of either wheat or barley. And so you can see around 2000 BC when these new crops were coming in from the rest to this point in China. And the key thing that we learn from this is that it's not just one subsection section of the population that's switching over, it's everybody doing it. So it's not one of those top-down things, it's when the change happens, it's something that uh, everybody, um, it's, 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 uh, and it ties in with the idea that what's happening here largely involves not a top-down thing from merchants or kings or emperors, but actually neighboring communities of farmers um, exchanging crops. And I want to sort of finish going back to your uh, uh, pasta uh, arrabbiata and, uh, and uh, another shot of both the knife and fork and this pasta noodles. Now, another bit of work that's been done on these noodles is they have found some, some microfossils which can be uh, related to millet uh, within these noodles. But um, there's a counter argument that you can't actually make noodles out of pure millet flour that you need to mix it with something, and, uh, and you mix it with, with, with wheat flour. And so although they haven't yet found um, direct evidence of wheat from these, and that may come, we're pretty much sure that this is a, an early fusion meal that has wheat from the west and millet from the east. And it's also fusion in terms of that cuisine. On the one hand, it's not like, it's, it's neither like, uh, pasta is neither like the baked loaf nor is it like the, the gooey, sticky rice. It is sort of halfway um, between the two. And so just as a kind of bit of speculation, uh, as well as, uh, I, I think what's happening, I should say, is the reason these crops are being mixed together ties back to those two stories I mentioned at the, at the, past, at the, at the past. There's a lot of ecological advantages to mixing your cereals and having, having a, a, a large grain cereal like wheat and also a tough, ecologically hard, hardy cereal like millet together. It allows you to do new things. So I think there's a lot of, we, one can understand the ecological advantage, but we can also see the other uh, uh, narrative going on, the culinary narrative of new ideas coming about what it is to eat and what that means about sharing food generally. So I'll leave it there. And I want to thank two groups of people. I want to thank um, uh, my team, uh, which includes 
uh, three members who have been Darwin Fellows and three who have been Darwin Associates. But I also want to thank my collaborators in this presentation. Who, when, I, when I said to uh, um, Ivan and Fergus, could we just chuck you know, a bit of millet in? Just so I, and they said, and they just, uh, through, through their initiative, they say, let's not do that. Let, let's do the whole lunch around uh, your lecture. So give us the whole thing. And I think they've done uh, brilliantly. So I want to thank them too. Thank you very much.